Good morning, everyone. Uh, first thing I have to do is apologize. I, uh, I, I caused the change in the schedule. Uh, I've had a heck of a morning, but more on that later. I think actually we can, we can reference that. Uh, look, I was thinking about what to say here this morning, and everyone in this room knows far more about health than I do. Right? I've, I've done different things. I've worked in FMCG, I've worked in manufacturing, uh, I've been involved in marketing, supply chain, tech, uh, and now banking. And I've been on the board of the HSE for three years, and I feel like a complete novice still. Right? It's just such a complex space. Um, but one of the things that I've seen is that we have such similarities across all these different sectors that it'd be crazy not to look for the learnings we could take. So I'm just going to share a couple of perspectives with you uh, on how I think about delivering large-scale change. The first thing is there's a difference between invention and innovation. Invention is you're out on the edge of something, you're following a scientific principle, sometimes it's an accident that we find something, right? But producing the invention doesn't actually make any difference. It's the application of that new idea or that new technology that makes a difference, and that, I think, is where innovation kicks in. So there's lots of cool technologies that have floated around. The first electric car, by the way, was in the 1920s. Right? It was an idea before its time, so it didn't work. The idea, I have a plug-in hybrid as well. I was listening to the panel. I have a plug-in hybrid as well. Fantastic mileage, great tax band. Uh, but, uh, but one of the things I'd say is that unless I'm sure I'm working off renewables, then is it really, what's the point? Right? So one of the things about innovation and really being able to make sure we've realized the benefit from innovation is there's a connectivity. Everything is a system. Right? So I coded for a long time in my career. Uh, and then when I went into management and leadership, the largest organization I've run is 2,600 people. And the way I see it, I see the organization like a system. So you're trying to deliver change. You're trying to debug a system sometimes if you've got organizational problems. So how do you deliver innovation in a complex space like that? So in the HSE, I think of it as an organization where everything is done through people at a distance. Everything. And the question that I've been asked around, is it, is it the doctors, or is, it the, is it the consultants, is there an arrogance, is it the HSE themselves? I actually don't think there are any villains in this story. I really don't. I think that in the HSE, the broader HSD, right, there's no... I, Almost everybody, like any, any section of society, wants to come to work and do a good job. Of course we know there's always a small percentage of people who are going to come and you know, want to sit in the broom cupboard and read the paper. Right? But, but we should legislate for the 98% of people who want to come and do great work. I mean, health is a vocation for most of the people who go into it. A vocation. If you can pour the right fuel into a vocation, my God, like people, the things, I mean, you only have to look at the pandemic, the things people did in delivering care and supporting care. It was enormous, right? So if we can support that right, it should work. So where's the issue with delivering the kind of technology changes we need to deliver in, in the HSC? There's a few things. I think there are silos. If I look at how IT uh, budgets are distributed, uh, you've got budgets into, for example, the large hospitals. So Tallow will have its own IT budget. James will have its own IT budget. And we're not necessarily good at coordinating what it is we're trying to do. And when I think about the RHAs and getting, commu getting, getting services closer to the, to the, the recipients of those services in the community, it would be very important that we're all working toward the same thing. So the, the cyber attack is an interesting one. How many people in the room have taken time to look at the report that the board commissioned that PwC produced for us? Not many. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. And, there's two aspects to the report. One is quite technical. If you're not into cyber, don't go there. Um, but if you, if, if you look at the other side of it, it really talks about an organization. And two roles were coming out of that. One was the chief information security officer, which you would expect. But the other was a chief technology and transformation officer. And that and is important. And it was interesting, as we were working through from the, the production of the report to the production of a job description, how often that ampersand disappeared and it became chief technology transformation officer. No, 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 no. This chief technology and transformation officer. 
because I think a lot of the technologies that we're talking about here today will be the catalyst for much of the transformation. There was a question asked about the RHAs and, and you know, the innovation to support it. My personal view is that the RHAs can't work unless we're on common systems. If we're not sharing the data, like why would an RHA want to run its own procurement system or its own HR system or its own, I mean, why take the cost and hassle? That's not the point of the RHA. The point of the RHA is to focus on the sort of things that have been talked about here today at the point of care, right? So what's the role of a center in this to be able to take that and, and clean that out of the way so people can do this innovation stuff at the front? So there are five things that I think need to be done uh, by anybody who's trying to deliver change at this scale. The first is, and by the way, if you're interested in reading on this one, this model comes from two guys called Kuz and Posner. Uh, I like it because you can actually use um, quantitative measurement on it. The first thing you do is you challenge the process. So you challenge the status quo. There's quite a bit of that going on. I think the fact that this group have come together is really positive because I think it'll create a weight behind some of that challenge for the way we've operated and thought about it in the past. And there are some problems that are right there to be solved, and there are solutions sitting in this room. Right? Now, not like the electric car in the 1920s. We need ideas who are not just in search of a problem, but there's a problem waiting to be solved. So that's the first thing. So challenging the process is key. It's part of what I've tried to do in my role in the board, is bring a technologist's perspective, hence the creation of that role, for example. The next thing we have to do, and this is the most crucial, and this is where most change fails immediately. You must inspire a shared vision. Now think about the words in that. Inspire, shared vision. So it can't just be something that's a tone from the top tell. It has to be something that people can feel is going to make a difference. So if you're somebody in the system, for example, who's come through a vocation and you feel this is going to enable you to do better work, help more people. Like it needs, but everyone needs to feel inspired to do this thing. Actually, as a country, we should feel inspired about whatever we're going to talk about. Next word is key, shared. The stuff that's happening here today and the stuff that Martin Curley and the team uh, in, in the HSC, the digital team, are doing is excellent stuff. There's great things happening. Martin and I had a conversation uh, some months ago where he shared, he shared with me the uh, stay left, shift left strategy, and I think it was very good. And he said, now we finally have a, a tech strategy for, for the HSC. And I said, well, we don't. We have a slice of it. Because that is only one part of delivering technology services. Now, it's a crucial part. But without all the other foundational things, it won't work. Right? So shared. Who in the HSE knows what's going on here today? Who in the HSE would be educated enough to be able to articulate the vision that we're trying to create here today? So we have to find a way to make sure that people can see themselves and see their problems and their opportunities in whatever it is we're going to talk about. Because otherwise, we've just got lots of inventions. Right? We need to find a way to make sure that people can share the vision, that they're behind the vision. It's not just our vision sitting here in a room, it's everybody's vision. So it's inspired and it's shared. And the last thing, the word vision is interesting. So one of the things about the word vision for me is it's not strategy or plan, right? Actually, if someone's talking about a vision for something, oftentimes it's really important that you've got a very clear destination and a lot less important about the road to that destination. What tends to happen in public services, I think, and actually in a lot, of, a lot of companies, private companies as well, is we start talking about the budget, the time, the specific things we're going to deliver, and we spend a lot less time talking about the outcome. So the vision should really be about an outcome. It should talk about what's going to be different, what's going to feel different. How will I, in whatever my role is in the HSE, see myself in that future? Right? So inspire a shared vision. So all the cool things that we're talking about here today, great. But unless we can inspire a shared vision, it's going to go nowhere. It's invention, not innovation. The next thing that we have to do if we're successful in inspiring a shared vision is, is enable others to act, enable people to act. So having figured out what needs to be done, having got people on board, we then need to work out what obstacles have to be removed for them 
what skills do they need? The, the question around Tala, uh, TUH and the, uh, and the training, I think we should be doing lots of training on digital for people. I think we should be offering free education. We should be educating people on anything they want to know about in technology. We should be thinking about cyber. In fact, we're moving more and more this way that when we talk about cyber defense, I actually talk about you defending your family, you keeping yourself safe in cyber. That starts there, right? Um, so, so enabling others to act is crucial. Now, this is tricky, right? So if we think about limited resources, and I'll go back to what I was saying about, for example, the large hospitals having their own budget, quite sizable budgets. One way this might work, don't take this as policy, this is just my perspective, okay? Um, one way this could work is if we look at the totality of all tech spend across the whole HSE system, and we ask ourselves, if we were to bucketize that and ask Tala to focus on a specific area and prove out, develop and prove out that technology so that it is an innovation, <laughs> that can be replicated into other facilities. So Tala takes that on, gets that money, and instead of competing with everyone else to build the thing, they build it on behalf of everyone else. So that's, that's part of enabling others to act. So we need to think about that, right? So it's a way of breaking down the silos and trusting. There are a number of heavy duty things that need to be delivered. Let's, let's parcel them up. Let's create a trust. Let's have people go deliver them on behalf of other people in the system. The other thing that you have to do then, once you've enabled others to act and they're off and running, and if you think about this from the point of view of, uh, of any change you've been involved in that runs over time, even if you get you know, yourself, you get G'd up about a thing or you get a team G'd up about a thing, um, and it's running and then you start to hit the grungy parts of delivery, gets hard, people start losing sight of what was the objective, what was the outcome I was after, Oh, is, this ever, is this thing ever going to work? It's running long, it's gone over, oh. And actually part of our job then, from a leading innovation point of view, is what Kuz and Posner term, encourage the heart. We are human beings. I had a German boss once who said, we are, not, we are human beings, Tim, not human doings. Not to, human doings doesn't translate as well. Um, but, but we're human beings, right? And, emotional creatures, if it starts to get grungy and hard, we can't forget and lose our way. So part of our role, and we have to think about how we do this so we have a collective approach to it, is how do we keep everyone motivated and keep it going so that when it hits the machinations of, you know, it could be something like an election. Somebody comes in, someone's looking for a headline. There's a terrible tragedy, but it's not necessarily representative of the whole system, but it, you know, takes all the headlines. How do we manage through those kind of issues so that we stay the course? to deliver the shared vision. And then the last thing that they say, and I think this is interesting for a group like this, is you model the way. And what we mean by this is you show up and behave the way you're asking everyone to behave. And I think it's interesting for a room like this to think about that because a lot of you are going to be in competition with each other for some of the opportunities. There's room for lots and lots of stuff to go on, but there is gonna be some level of competition. And how we show up if we say, for example, that the intent of all of this is to deliver great outcomes for service users, but then what people see is people in this group, for example, being you know, particularly petty or, or, or non-competitive or any of the other things, it'll, it'll, shake the, it'll shake the system. So if you want to be part of this, if any of us want to be part of this, we have to model the way. So those are the things you do to deliver, to deliver change. So my morning, let me just give you an example, right? So I was away for the weekend with my wife and daughter. I have three kids, two boys who were growing up and working away, and my daughter, who is, of course, my favorite, uh, because she's just so much better than the other two, right? Um, and uh, she, she's, just start, she's just finished her first year in Trinity. She's studying the history of art and architecture. So I'm kind of prepared to you know, support her for the rest of my life. <laughs> but, um, but it's her passion, she loves it, and so she finished college, so my wife and I just booked a weekend, we went to Paris, and I was taking around all the museums, all the art museums, and educated whether I liked it or not. So a lovely weekend, right? But one of the things that happened when I was there was I actually got irritated eyes. So I think it was some kind, I don't really have hay fever, but I just got some sort of irritation. So I popped into a, uh, popped into a um, uh, pharmacy, and uh, they gave me some drops. So here's the, here's the first thing, right? So here are the drops that I was given. All right, tiny little, tiny little bottle of drops. And when I was coming through Charles de Gaulle uh, yesterday uh, to come home, 
I had these in my pocket. So when I took out my phone, I took these out and threw it in the tray. According to the airlines, this is a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> right? And the very, oh, 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 there's a lot of going on in French. But apparently, it's pretty easy to defuse this weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> but I was thinking about it when I was coming through, and I was saying, sometimes the solutions are pretty bloody simple. Right? Sometimes it's just remove the nonsense. I heard, I heard one, I was doing a, an operational review uh, on, a, on a, I chair a board committee, and uh, one of the examples I came out was uh, an audiologist, I won't say where, an audiologist who managed to increase the throughput in her practice in, in a hospital uh, by 30, over 30%. Her solution, she put two chairs outside the door. Because the people who were coming to see her were sitting in a meeting room on the next floor up. So when she would send the call, they would have to come down. But she wouldn't send the call up to have them to come down until her office was empty. So she was just losing time. Some of the people would be infirm, slow moving. So she put two chairs outside her thing and increased her productivity by 30, over 30%. It doesn't always have to be hard. Right? So innovation, there's a mindset to it as well. And then this morning, the reason I was late was um, I've started uh, tracking my sleep because I don't sleep very much. I, I tend to sleep only four or five hours a night. But, so I started tracking my sleep because I, I don't know if anybody saw there was a program on the BBC about sleep and I was fascinated by it, so I thought I'll give this a try. And uh, one of the things I started using recently was this Apple, on the Apple phone, you've got a thing where you can set your sleep time, right? I hadn't used it before, I usually just set the ordinary alarm. So I set it last night and set the time, but forgot that you have to flick the little thing at the bottom to set the alarm on, right? So I had a great night's sleep, right? But, but I thought it was interesting, right? Because Apple have done so much fabulous innovation, but that's a fundamental user experience flaw. If somebody takes the time to set that, would you not remind them you haven't checked this little button down the bottom? Right? And this is a company who, if you look at the innovation they brought, like Microsoft, I was in Microsoft. When, I remember when the Apple iPhone came out, we were thinking, we've had all of this for ages. You could have your, your maps on your phone, your email on your phone, you could browse. What did Apple do that made the iPhone successful? It wasn't the phone at all. It was the App Store. They closed the gap, an invention. So Microsoft had this invention, but it was just too hard for people to get at. Apple made it easy. Here's another interesting one. You know when you take a device, any kind of electronic device you buy now, and you take it out of the box? It's charged, right? Apple were the first people to do that. For those of you who are old enough to remember when you would buy uh, electronic devices, the first thing you'd have to do when you took it out of the box was charge the flipping thing, right? So they've done super things, but even they can get something simple like this wrong. So that was, my, that was the start of my morning. So I crashed out of bed and disturbed my wife and dived into the shower and texted Martin and said, oh my God, I'm gonna be late. I hate being late. I have OCD, it freaks me out, right? And uh, so I jumped in the car and I'm on my way. Martin said, drive safely. And that was in my head, drive safely, Tim, drive safely, Tim. So I'm driving down the Nace Road. So I'm, I'm, I'm out in Newbridge, so it's a good run, right? And I'm looking, and you know, you've got the sat-nav going, and it's telling you what time you're going to arrive, and it's saying 28 minutes past nine, and I promised I'd be here by half past, and I'm thinking, oh, sugar. So I'm driving along, and then, first of all, it started raining. What is it with Irish people not being able to drive in the rain? You'd think we'd have enough practice, right? So driving in, and I'm watching the time change. And it was, it was just such a funny thing, right? There's a, I was just going and I'm thinking, I'm looking and I'm doing the calculation in my head and I'm thinking, I'm, it's gonna take me three minutes to do it or four minutes to every kilometer. And then I feel like I'm picking up time and then the last six kilometers, 35 minutes. And that's what it's like when you're trying to deliver change. And I couldn't help thinking about it as I was coming along, right? That it just, you can pick up speed, you go along and then you hit the last bit and it's so close. But that's the piece where we have to encourage the heart. Right? And uh, it took me, it, it did redeem itself, I'll have to say. It took me down the way and took, shaved eight minutes off my journey, and that was great, until I went down the laneway and found out I couldn't turn, I couldn't fit down this laneway. So. But all of those things, it's, that's what delivering change is like. Right? We have a grand plan, we have the technology. This is why two companies can buy the same technology, same hardware, same software, at the same time, one will succeed and one will fail. Why? It's not the hardware or the software, it's what I call the squishyware. We, 
we are the thing that will make it work or fail. And you can't do it alone, especially in a system like the HSE where everything happens through people at a distance. So whatever comes out of today, and, and I have to say I'm really encouraged by some of the stuff I've seen, whatever comes out of today and whatever we do going forward, let's concentrate on, on that inspire a shared vision. And then we can connect with the, like, the board of the HSE and the department and the various departments to think about how we enable others to act. So that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>